We're here with Dr. Michael Provence, Associate Professor of History at the University of California in San Diego. We'll be talking about Syria particularly and the region in general. Uh, Michael, tell me a little bit about the background of Syria. You know, after the father died and the son came in, who's now the current leader, to give me a, a sense of where this revolt, where the wellsprings of the revolt uh, occurred. Yeah. Well, um, when Hafez al-Assad died in, in 1999, uh, his son, Bashar al-Assad, who wasn't, the, wasn't really the chosen son, but the second son, who had been an ophthalmologist in training in London, uh, had been sort of getting groomed for a few years. But people didn't really take him seriously until suddenly the father died in the summer of 99. And uh, he, he was sort of immediately thrust into uh, the presidency. There was an, a, a constitutional uh, amendment. Uh, the, the, prime, the vice president stepped aside and suddenly he was president. And it was a kind of a, it was a mo I mean, I was living in Syria at the time. And uh, his death, the death of the father was a big surprise. The emergence of the son was not a surprise and, and it was, there was a kind of a, a perception among people the, the future was really worrisome. And, and once the succession took place, people kind of relaxed. And, you know, there was some continuity. I mean, uh, Syrians, I think, uh, uh, like people in the region generally, saw the Lebanese Civil War. Uh, they had seen other kinds of regional uh, uh, conflagrations and were really worried, are worried, uh, about instability and, and and chaos at the top. So he, he had a kind of an easy time, Bashar al-Assad, as he became the president at 34. And um, the, the impression I had was that he immediately began to use uh, this, this, this uh, relief on the part of the population to kind of ease things up, to release prisoners. He closed a prison. This, there was a period that was called the Damascus Spring that took place. This was 2000. This was the, the fall and, and, uh, and, and spring, fall of 2000, the spring of 2001. And dissidents began to, there was a free newspaper, a, a, that is to say a non-governmental newspaper. And, and people embraced this. And the impression was, among many people, and myself included, was that he was using his popularity with the public as a weapon against elements of, the, of his father's government people who were still lurking around in the shadows, people who were in charge of the security agencies, people who had been high-ranking military officers who were back there getting ready or preparing to pull strings. And he used his popularity as a weapon against those people. Uh, but within a year, once he was firmly uh, ensconced, uh, the repression began again, and people began to be rounded up. The, the discussion forums were closed down. Uh, some of the liberalizing reforms were changed, but the reforms that were not changed had to do with, with capitalism, with uh, freeing capital, uh, with, with privatizing certain things, uh, and stuff along those lines. And so the, the kind of, there, there emerged over the coming years uh, a kind of a new class of, we could say, crony capitalists of his generation uh, who emerged and and kind of gutted the ideological component of the previous nationalist, socialist uh, 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 government that his father had, had, had stood for. Uh, you talk about capitalism. Uh, during this period of the sun and liberalizing capitalism, was the country open to foreign investment? Could you talk about that a little bit? It had not been. Uh, and I mean, the Syrian economy was a closed economy. Uh, over the 30 years of Hafez al-Assad's rule. Uh, his son opened it, uh, but opened it to people who were connected. Uh, and so, for example, there was a hotel built in downtown Damascus, the Four Seasons, uh, which was built with money uh, that came from the Gulf. It was built with money from uh, uh, Walid bin Talal, uh, the financier. Uh, and it was built on the grounds of what had been a public park and a Mamluk uh, tomb complex. So these public properties were destroyed to make a kind of a new monument to 
what we can call crony capitalism. And this was, I think, uh, emblematic of the kind of reforms that took place. Uh, people who were close to the top became wealthy. And an entire new strata of, of kind of uh, uh, conspicuous consumption emerged on the part of people who were close to the government. Uh, the most notorious example, of course, is the cousin of the president himself, Rami Makhlouf, who uh, received the cell phone concession and became the richest person in the country and, and essentially controlled uh, or does control virtually the entire economy. So are you saying that <clears throat> there's no uh, Western money, no European money, no American investment, no Citibank in Syria? Well, there isn't much. Uh, I mean, the, the money that has flowed into the country has been uh, from Gulf investors. Uh, it's not like, say, for example, um, the Gulf states like Kuwait or, or Qatar that are fully uh, integrated into the world economy, that have giant uh, state stock portfolios, things like that. I mean, Syria is a, is a poor country. And during the 30 years of, of Hafez al-Assad's rule, uh, the, the economic engine of the country was agriculture, and it remains agriculture. And because of the uh, nationalist, socialist, uh, Ba'athist uh, ideology of the government, and because of the rural origins of the ruling uh, stratus, uh, Hafez al-Assad and the people around him, uh, the countryside did pretty well. And uh, the, the countryside was electrified. Uh, there were good schools, there were hospitals, stuff like that. And that was part of the ideology of rule. And conspicuous consumption, I mean, there was a lot of corruption, but it wasn't the kind of corruption that we see today. Today, the corruption is, is, uh, is huge uh, transfers of wealth from the public treasury in some, or control of capital from the public treasury to these, these selected individuals and people close to them. In those days, it was, it was different. It was corruption of the military structures. Uh, but the, the people would say that the living standard of Syrians in the 90s, in the 80s, was uniform and uniformly low. Today, you see Maseratis on the streets of Damascus, which is, or in the past 10 years. And this is actually sort of a shock. It's a, it's a, a, uh, it's a shock and it's a grievance uh, to people uh, within the country who are not prospering. And in those rural regions and places, the places, in fact, precisely the places uh, that have been most um, involved in the uprising over the last year, those are the places that have suffered and, and declined in economic prosperity over the past decade uh, as this kind of transfer has gone from, uh, from uh, supporting the countryside, supporting the pillars of legitimacy of the state, to enriching a select number of, of uh, people who are hooked up and close to the, to the government. Let's talk a little bit more about um, the uprising and the aggrieved. Is, is it more workers and peasants who are impoverished? Is it more the intellectual class? Or is it across class lines, this, this uprising that we're seeing now? Well. Uh, would be workers. <laughs> I think um, the well. I'll tell you an. Ex I'll, I'll give you an example. I have a friend who uh, lives in Dara, which is where the the uh, uprising began, and we haven't been able to contact him for well since the beginning. Uh, and I was talking with another friend uh, who knows this guy well, and uh, and he's a prosperous farmer, uh, a re reasonably prosperous farmer in this region. So he owns some land and. And uh, you know he has a, 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 a pretty nice house, and he has a car, a truck, actually, a farming truck. So this is, by Syrian standards, this is a pretty prosperous farmer. Now, we were talking about him, my friend and I, and he said, well, we don't have to worry about him because he's too old to protest, and his children are too young. So in this way, we have precisely identified the strata of, of the people who are most likely to be out in the streets who are uh, high school students, uh, college-age students, people who are frustrated, uh, unemployed, who have uh, aspirations to uh, some kind of material prosperity and yet cannot leave their parents' homes because they, they, can't, they can't earn enough money or even find jobs to go and, and make it on their own. 
uh, and, and the population has increased rapidly. Population growth is very high. Uh, and so these people are, are educated, literate, uh, cosmopolitan, watching satellite news stations, uh, and, and have quite a lot of knowledge about the outside world, and yet are, are really, have, really have their aspirations uh, uh, stunted uh, by what they think are the, the limited possibilities delivered by the government. Um, I think this is the this is the this is the the, the operative uh, group. Now there are many. There is a, a kind of a uh, a traditional oppositional uh, intellectual uh, uh, group or class within Damascus, within Aleppo. Uh, people who have been opposed to the government. Many of them have served time in jail. Some of these people are in their 80s, even older. So those people are still around too. Uh, but the people who are really out in the streets every day, day after day, are, are uh, people in their teens and 20s and maybe early 30s. In, in the very early stages, uh, were these people organized enough to bring specific grievances to the government? And if so, what was the government's response before we get to the stage we're seeing now on television? Yeah. Yes, they were. I mean, the grievances were the same grievances that we've seen elsewhere in, in, in the period of, of from late 2010 uh, through 2011 in Egypt and Libya and uh, in, 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 uh, in Bahrain, in Yemen, uh, and other places. Um, there, the, the demands were articulated in the first instance, I think, by people who were veteran activists uh, who had spent time in prison who were sophisticated and, and pointed in their criticisms. But they were adopted uh, by uh, people who were protesting in the streets uh, who in some cases had never even known that those dissonance, those, those uh, oppositional intellectuals even existed. But they coalesced at this moment uh, in early uh, 2011 in February and March. The demands were uh, an end to the emergency law, which is effective martial, martial law in Syria. How, uh, long, how long has the emergency law been? It's been in, in, it's been in effect since 1963. And um, emergency law in Syria and emergency law elsewhere is actually colonial martial law. So it's, it's a, simply it's a, a kind of a, I mean, there was a period between 1948 uh, or 1946 when Syria was independent from France. Uh, to 1963, where emergency law was not constantly in action. But emergency law is, is simply uh, a, a evolution, uh, a, a legal um, uh, development of, of martial law imposed by the colonial regime. It's the same in, in, in Israel and Palestine. Many of the laws that enable people, house demolitions, for example, are actually British mandate colonial law codes that still exist. Uh, and so in Syria, it's very much the same. So this, this emergency law uh, essentially denies all of the constitutional guarantees that people, other, that citizens, nor ordinary citizens, should enjoy. And so the demand was rights of citizenship in our own country, an end to the emergency law, uh, democratic uh, uh, transition, uh, a multi-party uh, elections, uh, and and the rule of law, simply stated, very simple. Uh, and based on, I mean, it's an, and it's a very pointed critique because these are things the government claims to be doing anyway. Uh, so the structures of, these legal structures exist, uh, but they're not, they're not respect, respected by the government in the same way that they were not respected by the colonial governments that preceded these post-colonial governments. And when these, when these demands were presented to the government, what was their response? Give us time. Uh, we, can, we, we, we can talk. We're studying it. But this has gone on for 11 years, actually. Uh, we need more time. Uh, it takes time. It's, uh, we don't want to develop or to uh, change is important. We must change. We know we have to change. But we have to do it at our own pace. It can't be driven by uh, outside demands. And then. Finally, um, uh, in March, late March, there was a speech given by the president, which really was the, was the, the crucial turning point, uh, where um, President Assad, Bashar al-Assad, uh, denounced people who had been protesting as, as, uh, as traitors, basically, and people who had to be crushed uh, by the power of the state, and that the movement was a foreign conspiracy 
by which, of course, he means uh, foreign conspiracy motivated or, or uh, 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 under the impetus of, of the United States and Israel. Uh, and this was a kind of an insult to people who had been protesting. And this really sort of severed, I think, the, the last or undermined the legitimacy of the, of, the, of the president and the state. And this was a year ago now, uh, the, ending of, the end of, of March 2011. Internationally, who are Syria's friends, and how does that play out in what's going on? Russia and and uh, and Iran, uh, but I mean this is a shifting cast of characters. Russia and Iran, however, are are the two uh, constants in in Syrian geopolitics. Uh, since um, in the case of Russia, since the 60s, uh, the the late the mid 60s. Um, and in the case of, of Iran, since the Iranian Revolution or even before, uh, Syria had contacts with, with the people who became the revolutionaries in Iran even before the revolution. Uh, and Syria was, a, was an opponent of, of, uh, of the government in Iraq, uh, which was actually, of course, after the revolution, a kind of an ally of the United States. So there was a geopolitical uh, kind of a, uh, a chessboard the Syrians were with the, with the, with the Soviets, uh, they were with the Iranian revolutionaries, and they were against the, 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 uh, the United States, uh, uh, Israel, uh, and the, the, uh, the conservative mon monarchies uh, of the Gulf. Uh, and to some extent, this hasn't changed too much. The, the Syrians are still very close to Iran. Uh, people who claim that this has something to do with religion are, don't know what they're talking about. Uh, it has nothing to do with the, the uh, religious uh, component of the various uh, governing structures. Um, it's about geopolitics and national interests and, and, a, and, a, 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 and a relationship, a 30-year-old relationship based on, on mutual interest and, and mutual trust, probably, at the highest echelons of the Syrian and Iranian government. What we see on television is brutal. Here we are uh, in, in the spring, and the, the images on television from, is it Ham? Is that the... Uh, Hama. Hama. Uh, yeah. It, it's a repeat of what the father had done, only uh, with uh, more modern weapons, I suppose. Um, and there's talk of NATO, there's talk of intervention, and so on. And some people say we should do it to save lives. Other people say if we do it, it's the West going into another country in the Middle East, and, yeah. and so on. Talk to us... Uh, about that, if you can. Well, in 1982, uh, and in the preceding several years, uh, from the mid late 70s, there was a an insurgency in Syria, uh, led by the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, against the the government of Hafez al-Assad. Uh, Hafez al-Assad's government had been popular, relatively, uh, but the Muslim Brotherhood uh, opposed it on religious grounds, on political grounds, and began a kind of a, a campaign of assassination and, and, uh, and, and not exactly armed uprising, but sort of various outrages against the government and leading figures within the government. Uh, in 1982, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood barricaded itself within Hama, uh, this uh, fourth largest Syrian city behind uh, Damascus, Aleppo, Ham, Homs, and Hama. Hama is the, and uh, declared it a free city. Uh, the Syrian uh, government launched an assault on the city, sealed it, which is sort of uh, the, the, the standard practice for them. They seal the city, they cut off electricity, they cut off phone service, they cut off water. <coughs> sealed the city and then besieged it and destroyed the central area of the city and killed some tens of thousands of of citizens, including probably some who were armed uh, insurgents of the Muslim Brotherhood, declared the membership in the Muslim Brotherhood a, a crime punishable by death, uh, and uh, like I say, destroyed the city with artillery, uh, airstrikes, and then and then uh, uh, ground troops in the city. The troops were led by the president's brother, uh, a man named Rafat al-Assad, who later was expelled. Uh, from the family in a way and, and is in exile in London now. Not because of what he did then, although it was related. Uh, he was in a way punished 
as a kind of a, uh, a scapegoat for the repression, uh, but also because he challenged his brother's rule uh, within the country. So in 1984, he went into exile. The echoes with today are intense. Uh, Rifat al-Assad was in charge of the special forces uh, of the Syrian army, this sort of elite group that, w that, that carried out this. It was not the regular army. And today, uh, Mahar al-Assad, the, the brother, the younger brother uh, of the current president, Bashar al-Assad, is in charge of these same sorts of special forces that are in charge of, of the most brutal kinds of repression uh, within the country today, these elite forces. Um, so, but there were differences too. I mean, then the Muslim Brotherhood up uprising was limited to these one cities and the tactics were, were, uh, were kind of terror tactics and it was not broadly popular. Uh, today, there was a peaceful demonstration, movement of demonstrations that was kind of challenged immediately with appalling state violence. Uh, so it's a different kind of a, a movement. Uh, peaceful movement, a movement of broad-based opposition. Uh, and, and finally, uh, the government, as far as we know, has not used really heavy weaponry against these cities, except for artillery. Uh, no airstrikes, maybe helicopter gunships, but not very much. The devastation is shocking, but it's nothing, what, nothing like what a modern military could do if it really wanted to destroy cities. I mean, this is a sort of a thing that, that, that people who are appalled and, and outraged by the violence of the Syrian government uh, don't acknowledge that the government is actually not unleashing everything against these cities. If they did, the cities would be totally destroyed and all the population would be killed. Uh, and that is not the case. Um, but in Hama, in 1982, in the space of two days, the government killed more people than have been killed in the entire year uh, since this uprising. Now, so the tactics are different. The outcomes are a bit different, and the 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 kind the contours of the of the uh, of the confrontation are different because this uprising is much more popular and much broader, and much much more threatening in a way to the legitimacy of the of the government than the Muslim Brotherhood uprising of 1982. You, you say it's broader. Can you? you Let's talk about that a minute. I mean, is there a way to assess how broad it really is? In other words, within Syrian society, there are those who will back the president and those who are back the resistance. Yeah. How, do, how does that fall in, in your scholarship uh, in terms of numbers and so on? How popular is this popular uprising? Well, I think it's, it's very hard to say. I, I mean, n nobody can really say. And I think that people who would claim to be able to quantify these kinds of percentages are, you know, are not, it's not credible. Um, now, there is a sectarian component which has been exploited um, uh, very effectively by the state, by the government, uh, which is to say that uh, the uprising is, uh, is based on uh, uh, Islamist criminals and foreign uh, conspiracies, foreign conspiracies from the Gulf, uh, by, uh, by Islamic extremists. The government is composed in its uh, top uh, uh, echelon of people who are members of a sectarian minority, a kind of a, uh, a quasi-Islamic sectarian minority in Syria. Um, and uh, there's a large Christian population which has been usually supportive of the government. The government has made the case repeatedly, and since the very beginning, that, uh, that the uprising was not people with legitimate grievances for citizenship, but rather armed criminal Islamist terrorists. And that uh, if they were, that only the government stands uh, to keep chaos, disorder, and massacres at bay. Uh, and with 30 or 40 percent of the population, this is a compelling argument. Uh, so the, the government has succeeded, I think, in terrifying people so uh, seriously that they support the government because they believe that the opposition is, 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 is worse. Um, so, but the opposition or the protest movement did not start out as a sectarian movement, and I'm not sure, it's, I don't think it's a sectarian movement today. Uh, there are Islamists within it, that's for sure. Uh, but there's also members of every sectarian minority also represented. 
uh, among uh, opposition politicians and even people out on the streets. Um, so we can say that, that uh, there are you know, thousands and thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people have demonstrated, probably millions of people have demonstrated in opposition to the government uh, over the last year, repeatedly, at risk of, 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 of mortal peril. Uh, and uh, probably hundreds of thousands of people have demonstrated in favor of the government uh, with no risk, actually, to them of any kind. Uh, and in some cases, they were compelled for reasons of their vocation or whatever. I mean, it's well known that, for example, the schools get a holiday and all the kids are expected to go out on the streets and proclaim their love for the president. Uh, everybody knows this. It's a kind of a performative uh, duty that Syrians are accustomed to. Does this mean that they support the government? No, but you know, you're, I mean, to, to not go risks something. So there's a, a wide spectrum here. Uh, the, the percentage of people who actually support the government under any circumstances uh, and believe everything is probably very small. Uh, you know, but then there's also people who are, uh, have benefited materially in significant ways, I mean, who have become literally millionaires in the last 10 years. And of course, for these people, uh, the government is extremely, they may not have accounts in Swiss bank, they may not have Swiss bank accounts, and yet they're very wealthy within Syria. They're deeply committed, people like this. We're talking about the high-ranking military officers, people who are these crony capitalists and so on. These people are deeply committed to the government. They must be. They have to be. They are not all uh, Alawi, not by any means. There are many Christians, Sunnis. Uh, they're representative of all uh, religious uh, uh, groupings within the country. Professor Provence, thanks so much for your comments. We uh, look forward to speaking with you again for part two. Thank you.